Welcome to the Four Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 1, Session 4B, Digging in Holy Ground, Part 3. Another topic that I must cover is, why don't we have more than four official Gospels? Well, there actually are many Gospels, quote-unquote, most of which are factually or not attributed to the apostles, but only four are canonical or officially esteemed as scripture. Some may even contain other genuine sayings of Jesus, which were not represented in the quote-unquote official four, but the rest are called apocrypha or pseudepigrapha, because they also contain information which does not fit with the rest of the Bible. Because of this, they were rejected by the early church and therefore not included in the official quote-unquote canon, C-A-N-O-N, of Scripture. Now, Luke states that, quote, many had taken in hand, unquote, but only four have the certification of being from above. There are many, quote-unquote, unsanctioned Gospels, which either exist in entirety or in part, just having portions quoted or merely named in the writings of the Church Fathers. Some of the more well-known ones are the Gospel of Peter or the Gospels of Thomas, of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Philip, or the Gospel of the Hebrews. These are called pseudepigrapha because they have a famous name attached to them in an effort to give them credibility, but they definitely were not written by that person. All of these were rejected by the early Christian believers from inclusion in the official canon of Scripture, because in some way or another they did not fit with the rest of the Bible. The same is true for many Old Testament apocrypha books. They contain information that contradicts Scripture. Now, every so often, the news media reports the quote-unquote discovery of one of these quote-unquote new or quote-unquote lost Gospels, but that's just a marketing effort to, to generate interest. And, you know, they probably have a file with a bunch of stuff in it to fill in on low news days. <laughs> on, on days when the rest of the world is not going crazy. Yeah, our, you know, our, our news media is a business. It does market their product. Yeah. If you haven't noticed that by now, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you, all right? But back to the Gospels. I advise sticking with the four that we have. But to be thorough, I'm going to mention a few of these so-called Gospels. So, first one, the Gospel of Peter. It was dated in the 2nd century. Now, it's in addition to the canonical epistles of First Peter and Second Peter. Those are legit. But in addition to that, Peter was real popular because there was a Gospel of Peter, there's an Acts of Peter, there's a preaching of Peter, and even an Apocalypse of Peter. All right? Now, the Gospel of Peter was discovered in 1886, buried with an Egyptian monk. Other Two other papyrus fragments of the Gospel of Peter were discovered later. It only covers the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. One interesting feature is that it exonerates Pontius Pilate. Oh. But among other things, it contradicts established scripture saying Jesus, quote-unquote, preached to them that sleep, unquote. Now, we know that is not true because he was dead when 
somebody is dead, they are dead. Period. Ecclesiastes declares that there's no consciousness in death. So, Jesus did not preach to the spirits in prison when he was dead. He was dead. He had to die as dead as Adam to redeem man. He preached to the imprisoned spirits after he had been raised from among the dead. So that's the Gospel of Peter. Then, the Gospel of Thomas. That's a collection of quotes from Jesus that was discovered in Egypt in 1945. Other papyrus documents were later recognized to be copies. Two-thirds of the Gospel of Thomas mirrors the sayings of Jesus in the four Gospels. Other quotes are said to be secret quotes of Jesus that support Gnostic beliefs of the 2nd and 3rd centuries. They were part of the Coptic Christians' libraries. And Gnosticism purports that knowledge of special things is what saves you. Um, it was thought to have been written in the 2nd century. Then you have the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. That was discovered in 1896. And in two other papyrus documents since then. Uh, like other documents discovered in Egypt, most scholars say that the Gospel of Mary Magdalene supports Gnosticism. The apostles supposedly asked Mary Magdalene to tell them of any special teachings that Jesus told her but had not taught them. Whew, there's a red flag. They were the twelve, and Jesus chose and ordained them. He would have taught them that stuff directly. It was special. But then Mary discloses to them Gnostic teachings about the four powers, exousia, and the seven forms, morphe, of Gnostic teaching. And then Andrew challenges her. And says, Jesus never taught us that. And then Mary starts to cry and asks, do you think I made this up? And she accuses Peter of being hot tempered. <laughs> and it even says that Jesus loved Mary more than the apostles. <laughs> and, and that's why he told her this knowledge and not them. Whoa, Nellie, red flag, red flag, red flag. Oh, <laughs> that's the gospel of Mary Magdalene. Then you have the Gospel of Judas. That's a Gnostic Gospel discovered in the 1970s. It was written in the 2nd century. Irenaeus mentioned it, but no copies had been found until 1970. It is rumored the Vatican, though, has a copy, but they won't disclose it. <laughs> that smacks of the usual conspiracy theory traits about these things. But anyway, guess what? The Gospel of Judas exonerates Judas Iscariot, which instead of betraying Jesus for his own reasons, says that Judas was following specific instructions from Jesus. <laughs> Duh, right. Whew. It also asserts that the disciples had not learned the true Gospel, which Jesus only taught to Judas. Whoo, big red flag there. And then it teaches about Gnostic beliefs of the creation. The red flag, red flag. Uh, then you have the Gospel of Philip. This is another 2nd century Gnostic document. It was discovered in 1945 in Egypt. Its claim to fame is that it says Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. And then it goes on to explain Gnostic mysteries. Ooh, wee, ooh, ooh, wee, ooh. <laughs> All right. Gospel of Hebrews. Gospel of the Hebrews is another second century document, but it only has survived in quotations from other writers. And it talks about Jesus's supposed preexistence. 
the Holy Spirit in it is said to be made up of wisdom that's called a mother. Woo. So the list goes on. There's there's the Gospel of Marcion, second century, the Gospel of the Basilides, that's second century Gnostic, the Gospel of Truth from Valentian, second centuries, uh the Gospel of the Four Heavenly Realms, that's second century Gnostic. Uh, the Greek Gospel of the Egyptians, second century. The Gospel of the Twelve Apostles, that's written in Syriac. The Gospel of Perfection, from the fourth century. The Coptic Gospel of the Egyptians, also called the Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit. And then you have the Gospel of the Nazarenes, the Gospel of Ebionites, the Gospel of the Twelve. There's a whole bunch of these. Now, there are even some books that supposedly tell of Jesus' missing years, that time of after his nativity and trip to Egypt, back when uh, we hear of him again when he was 12. Those are called the Infancy Gospels. Then there are some other books that try to fill in that time that of Jesus' adolescent years up to the time he emerges again in the being baptized of John. The, those allege that Jesus went to China or went to India and studied there under the mystics who taught there. But I think we can say that was all baloney. Now, how can I assert that? Well, I think that we have received a unique view of all of this, having just finished the Old Testament history class. Many scholars are looking back upon the Gospels through the perspective of the Christianity that came afterward. But they don't seem to understand something that was very clear to us that the Gospel era was not Christianity, albeit it was the seed of it. The Gospel era was the zenith of Judaism. To whom did Jesus come to minister? the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he said, right? His interaction with the Gentiles was minimal, right? Well, were the gospel believers expecting the church to happen? No. They were expecting the millennial kingdom, right? We proved that by showing that not one Old Testament prophecy was intended for the church. They all anticipated the resurrections and the millennial kingdom. Why was that? Because the church was hidden in the great mystery. Any similarities were because God gave us in the church some of the same things he will give the Jews in the future. So, since that is true, would Jesus have needed to visit Gentiles for teaching during those years? Absolutely not. Can you see why I'm so sure? Look, I mean, if God wanted to bring any information to his son during those years, he could easily do so. How? Nazareth was a truck stop along the Roman interstate, the Via Maris. It was being crisscrossed by caravans from afar constantly. So what did they talk about in the caravansary fires at night? Yeah, I think that's where Jesus learned some things in these parables. He talks about people traveling to a land far away and coming back. Where do you get that information? There are also these infancy Gospels that tell about miracles that Jesus supposedly did as a precocious child. Jesus allegedly does various miracles, including making clay birds alive and cursing other children that they die. What? And then raising them from the dead (laughs) and a bunch of other miracles. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When... Did Jesus receive the Spirit when he was baptized? Bingo! So are those true? No. 
Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there are instructions on the Internet on how to write romance novels, all right? You can look it up. They say you have to start off with something they call the hook, all right? And then you follow their steps. Well, you know what? There's a common thread to all these, quote-unquote, other Gospels. If you want to write one, step one, name it after some famous person, preferably in the Bible. That person claims to have special secret knowledge that Jesus only told them. And then you can pump your favorite theology. So, I mean, we could even do one, all right? Let's, let's do the Gospel of Bozo. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Was he in the Bible? Oh, no, no. That's an alternate spelling of Boaz, okay? Bozo. So Jesus appeared to Bozo and told him great secrets. If you tweak Bozo's nose a certain way, it'll make miracles happen. Yeah, right. Okay, then all you have to do is translate that into ancient Greek, write it on a papyrus, bury it somewhere, and then discover it, and voila! It's the Gospel of Bozo! That's right, woohoo! It has secret Jesus stuff! <laughs> I mean, I could even qualify as his spokesman. I actually sold Bozo his computer when I managed the Radio Shack computer store at Water Tower Place on Michigan Avenue in the near north side of Chicago. That's right, the third incarnation of Bozo, Jimmy DeAria is his name, who was playing Bozo on WGN-TV Chicago, came to the store and bought his Tandy 1000 computer from me. Ha-ha! <laughs> All right, I know, I know, it's a tenuous connection to Bozo. Yeah, he wasn't in costume. But the connections that these extra Gospels make are just as murky. So, so anyway, the Gospel according to Bozo could never be genuine. Even, even, even if it was an infancy bozo. Uh, even if it told how Jesus played bozo pranks on his playmates. Even if it recorded some Jesus jokes. I'm sure he told some good ones. <laughs> but, but you'd have to get the punchlines by revelation. All right. Oh, okay, here's one. What kind of text would you get if you deleted the angels from the Christmas story? A sans serif font. Right? <laughs> Why don't umbrellas work for angels? Because they're holy, of course. Why did the Red Cross ban Jesus? Because they're a non-profit organization. Um, why is Jesus not good at video games? you got to know that one. Huh. It, well, it takes him three days and three nights to regenerate lives. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Here, here's a good one. Current issue. What is Jesus' pronoun? H-Y-M-N. Woohoo! <laughs> You'll have to read the rest in the Gospel according to Bozo. All right, all right. All right. Uh, I'll stop. Those are all groaners. But Bozo would be proud. <laughs> but Christendom should have been groaning at these counterfeit Gospels from the start. There's even more. There are modern hoaxes proven to be forgeries, like the two forgeries claiming to be the Book of Jasher, or uh, the 1927 Gospel of Josephus, or the Gospel of Barnabas, that was a forgery written in the 1600s in which Jesus said, I'm not the Messiah. I was just a prophet. <laughs> Another forgery, in my opinion, is, is the Book of Mormon. Uh, oh, whoa, well, Nelly. But um, one recent document was hailed by the media as the gospel of Jesus' wife. But <laughs> later it's been declared a forgery. I guess they got a divorce. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, um, it was written on ancient papyrus to make it look old and it contained information regarding Jesus' supposed wife but later it was found to be associated with a whole bunch of other documents that were obvious forgeries so all right, all right. I got, I'm sorry I got to bring this session back to the word all right sorry about that 
But anyway, um, we'll now take up the rest of this session to cover the structure of the Gospels. No analysis of the Gospels should be presented without mentioning the masterful work of E.W. Bullinger. Uh, the reason I am of this opinion is that, among other stellar things, he presented structures for the four Gospels as well as all the rest of the books of the Bible. That is in the Companion Bible. So, if anybody could be esteemed an expert in structure, I think it was him. I don't agree with everything he proposed, so I guess I'm not going to be called a Bullingerite. But, in my opinion, he does rank very high among biblical scholars. Now, structure can be very subjective. What one sees, another may not. So, I can't discount the observations of other scholars, especially in the light of the fact that the Bible has multiple gem-like perspectives that we've mentioned earlier. Uh, The study of structure, of course, assumes that the writers intended there to be a structure in the first place. I am of the opinion that such things are the Holy Spirit's markings of genuineness, like, for example, the Ephesians tree That's an introversion with seven sets of threes in the book of Ephesians, and it is spectacular. I know that that was intended. So, we'll also see the obvious and beautiful structure in the Sermon on the Mount when we get to it, with its alternating sections of Caruso and Euangelizzo, preaching and good news encouragement. Uh, it was framed by nine Beatitudes in the introduction and nine Proverbs at the end. So I'm sure Jesus was aware of and utilized structure. Um, but anyway, I think that was a profound, exquisite trait of Jesus' words, uh, even confirmed by his opponents who said, no man has spoken like this man. So... I'd expect to see his words have a level of sophistication that such things as structure indicate. Um, Our Lord's words are so deep. They have a kaleidoscopic way of being understood among men. Therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if there would be many ways that the wondrous literature of the Gospels could be portrayed. So, uh, in this class, I'm going to be presenting at least two ways of looking at the Gospels, showing it from Bullinger's work on structure, and then featuring it from a spiritual point of view based on my study of the heavenly decrees, which commence and mark each phase of Christ's work. Now, if you have a copy of the Bullinger Companion Bible, it would be good for you to use during this class and when you review this teaching that I'm teaching tonight, if you don't have one, you can download one in PDF form for free off the Internet. Now, he has a page or two of notes before each gospel. I think it's like page 1305, page 1381, page 1427, and page 1510 for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, he shows the structure of each gospel. Now, he has his structure set out in what he calls introversions. That is A, B, C, C, B, A. All right. And Matthew has seven levels that go in and back out. Mark has six. Luke has seven. And John has five. Another term for Bullinger's introversion is a chiasm. C-H-I-A-S-M. Uh, the Greek letter chi is an, looks like an X. So it converges to a point and goes back out. All right. And that center point, it's a chiastic structure where the center points are emphasized. They're the focus. So, what's interesting 
is that all four Gospels have a chiastic structure and the same center elements are the kingdom and the king being proclaimed and then the king and the kingdom being rejected. All right. You can see this also in Bullinger's Appendix 119. So the kingdom and the king proclaimed and then the king and the kingdom rejected. It goes in and comes back out. All four Gospels have that same structure in the center of each of the Gospels. So, now, I'll give you a little bit of showing how that works. After the initial sections in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, the section that talks about the the proclamation of the kingdom... They all begin about the same way. Here's the way it begins in Matthew. Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Nephilim that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of, Neph- of the Nephilim by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Then the next verse. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now this is a turning point it's very clear because it's literally expressed from that time all right now also it is marked by a fulfillment of prophecy now why does it mention a fulfillment of prophecy? It's not just that it just happened to occur. No. This is a spiritual firework to celebrate something important spiritually. That is what a fulfillment of prophecy does. So next time you see in the Bible it says something's fulfilled, look and see what just happened. It's a spiritual firework. Wow. Okay, Mark, chapter 1, verse 14. Mark, chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying... The time is fulfilled. Another prophecy fulfillment. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark mentions the same incident. John's incarceration. Luke gives further information with which we can even pinpoint when it occurred within a week. Luke Chapter 4, verse 14. Luke, chapter 4, verse 14 through 21. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. Verse 21. And he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Prophecy, fulfillment, spiritual firework. Luke 4 contains the famous fulfillment of prophecy where Jesus reads from Isaiah 61. We know that this occurred very close 
to Pentecost in 27 A.D. because of the position of Isaiah 61 in the synagogue's pericope reading schedule. They had a three-year reading schedule. We know Isaiah 61 was read at this time right around Pentecost. So this is exactly when the acceptable year of the Lord began. Pentecost, 27 A.D. to Pentecost, 28 A.D. All right. This also was the launching of Jesus Christ, the Apostle. That's what the spiritual firework was. Then the Gospel of John does not quote the time when Jesus first began declaring the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not as clear as the other Gospels. But that's not too surprising because there's a different purpose for the Gospel of John, which was to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, then, the climax of the proclamation of the King and the Kingdom sections, according to Bullinger, is when Jesus asks his disciples, Whom do you say that I am? Immediately following is a big turning point. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the turning point was when Jesus said, Whom do you say that I am? From that time. And also there was a turning point earlier in Mark 1, the time was fulfilled. Mark 1, 14 and 15. And then Luke 14, 21, he began to say to them. The next turning point was when Jesus said, he asked, whom do you say that I am? And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that incident. And it's the beginning of a different phase of his message. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Mark and Luke conclude this incident with the same request. Mark 8, 29 and 30. Mark 8, 29. He said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. All right. Then, let's see here. Matthew sixteen twenty. Matthew 16, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And then Luke 9, 20 and 21, he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, You are the Christ of God. He straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. But Matthew gives some additional details. In Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19, Jesus said, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So, just like earlier in the Gospels when there's a clear turning point, 
Jesus began to preach a new message. So at first, the new message was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But now, in this point, there's another change of message. And Bollinger speaks of this change, this theme, which occurred at this time, stating, quote, Bollinger says, he introduced the subject of his rejection, of which he had never before given even a hint. When once he had begun, Bullinger says, he repeats it four times in each gospel, each time adding fresh details. That's Appendix 119 from uh, Bullinger's Bible. Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time forth, Jesus began to show to his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, this new information shocked the apostles because they had hitched their wagon to his star. They expected the glories that were prophesied of the Messiah and his followers. Therefore, this idea that Jesus would suffer and die was foreign and even detestable to them. Peter responded to it in his characteristically bold fashion, even daring to reprove the Lord. Remember Matthew 16, 22, 23. It says, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from you, Lord. This shall not be unto you. But he turned and said, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Ooh, that was a real slap. But Jesus would not tolerate any of that. Sharply rebuked Peter. This new theme is reiterated in Mark. Jesus would have to die and be raised again. Mark 8, 31. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. See, Mark uses that word began. He could have just said, and he taught them this. But no, it says he began. It's emphasizing that turning point. Uh, Matthew signified the launch of Christ being the apostle earlier in the same phrasing it began to teach this so um they could have omitted that word began and it would not have lost any sense but that that was given there for a reason he bullinger recognizes that as a section marker all right luke also concurs with this new theme that jesus would have to die and be raised again luke 9 22 Luke 9, 22, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised again the third day. Uh, so this is Jesus Christ, the apostle phase of his ministry coming to an end. And the new phase, Jesus Christ, the high priest, beginning. He would have to die, be raised from among the dead. This constituted the downward path to Jerusalem into the valley of human need. The chasm that was caused by the sin between God and men was going to be bridged by the sacrifice of God's pure son. Afterwards, the upward path into eternity through Jerusalem would be confirmed. Along with this change of focus came more new themes with Jesus emphasized in this phase of his ministry. So, I think that's all we're going to cover tonight. Um, the, so this is the chiastic structure of the Gospels that Bullinger pointed out. And we will cover more 
in the next session next week. So bless you.